Welcome to the inaugural event of the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute. Um, this is a new university-wide initiative which we've just started and this is our first event and we're really happy all of you could come. So before I tell you something about the Institute, I think it's best to call on uh, Robert Brunix, President of the University of Minnesota, uh, to say a few words. Um, Bob, you're up. Thank you, Chari, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to say, first of all, special thanks to uh, uh, Chari as the founding director of the Institute and thank him publicly for his leadership. Um, there are many, many people who have worked hard on this vision and this idea. Uh, I want to especially mention uh, CLA Dean uh, James Parenti, uh, Economics Department Chair Larry Jones, uh, and then an extraordinary advisory board that has been working tirelessly uh, to uh, spread the news about this very, very special institute and the opportunities it'll present uh, for the future of the University of Minnesota. I also want to welcome the uh, uh, family members of Walter Heller and Leonid uh, Hurwitz. Uh, Dr. Heller's son, I understand, Rick Heller is here. Is Rick here? Rick is in, in the second row. And your and daughter Karen Heller Davis, Karen, excuse me, Karen, and and, and grandson uh, Nick is, and Nick is over on this side, and uh, Dr. Herwich's uh, daughter Sarah Herwich Kogut is she here? She was scheduled to be here, and I I think she may arrive somewhat later. Uh, the Heller Herwich Institute is a very high priority. It's a top priority for the University of Minnesota. And as all of you know who are here today, uh, this institute honors two really extraordinary uh, scholars and leaders um, in the field of economics here at the University of Minnesota, the late Walter Heller, who shaped public policy under two presidents, uh, Kennedy and Johnson, and uh, Leo Hurwitz, whose theoretical genius won him the Nobel Prize in 2007, and many of you were available and uh, attended. Uh, events to honor uh, Professor Hurwitz before he died. I think it's very important, along with Tom uh, Sullivan, our provost, and other academic leaders on this campus, that we build on our strengths and comparative advantages. And economics is one of the university's great treasures. For more than 50 years, the university has been one of the best intellectual centers in the field of economics. And our economics alumni have become influential leaders here and abroad. In fact, I've had the opportunity to give honorary degrees and outstanding achievement awards to many of them around the world. We have a unique opportunity and we have a unique potential to build on our unique strengths and on the opportunity to enhance our standing as one of the top centers of economics research and teaching in the entire world. I'm truly thrilled by the caliber of the people we've attracted who are dedicated to this initiative and this mission, and those of you who are, who are joining us this evening. I'm absolutely confident if we work together, that we put our minds to this great cause that will make the Institute a reality and continue to make a difference uh, uh, in the entire world. Tonight's presentations will underscore the fact that we're uniquely positioned to solve critical problems facing our nation and our society as our, res our historic research and land grant mission demands. Our focus this evening on climate change and sustainability is also important and an important priority to the University of Minnesota. Beginning in 2004, uh, when the regents adopted a comprehensive sustainability and energy efficiency policy. I think we were one of the first universities in the entire world to do so. Since that time, we have made really great strides to reduce our own carbon footprint. We were among the first members of the Chicago Climate Exchange. I was recruited by one of your speakers, in fact, uh, over the phone early in the beginning of the Chicago Climate Exchange, and I think we were the first public research university to join the exchange. And uh, our goal at that time, we joined in 2004, was to reduce our carbon footprint by 1% a year. And by the end of 2006, when we measured our impact, uh, we had achieved a 40% reduction, not a 2% reduction in that particular time frame. 
Richard called me and said, you've made a lot of money on the exchange this year. And I said, how much? He said, 750,000 bucks. I said, woo, we can really use the money. He said, you can't sell it, you'll, you'll collapse the exchange, you're too big a player. <laughs> so, so we held, and we still came out well, as I recall. Uh, in 2007 and 8, I signed the President's, that is University President's Climate Commitment, and we have formed uh, two university-wide working groups. We have LEED certified buildings, uh, the stadium is a is a uh, silver certified uh, building. We just uh, achieved gold certification for the science teaching and student services building on the Mississippi River. I think one of the grand buildings on this campus, you must visit it. Last year, we uh, decommissioned buildings, we recommissioned buildings, we reduced energy, or energy use by 5%, we reduced carbon emissions here at the university by 25,000 cubic tons last year alone. Energy consumption has declined in the last 10 years under this policy, despite the actual increase in usable space at the University of Minnesota across the entire state. Finally, this university um, was one of only three universities in the United States to receive straight A's on the 2010 College Sustainability P Report Card, and we're really uh, proud of that, especially in this uh, era of great inflation. Um, but one of only three in the United States. It's a, a point of great pride to all of us. So I've shared this information to give you a sense um, that this is a very deep uh, priority. That is the issues of our environment are a very important priority to us um, and uh, it's, it's also a, a major priority in our academic programs here at the University of Minnesota. So I want to thank you for joining us this evening. I want to thank you for your support of the University of Minnesota. And uh, I really want to especially thank these great speakers you're going to hear from this evening. Uh, I want to begin by saying that, so we originally conceived of this institute. We thought of it as a fairly modest kind of thing. Uh, we went to meet with uh, President Bronix, and he said, you guys are nuts. Why are you thinking so small? Uh, and so, Thanks to the administration and to, uh, to President Brunick's personal commitment to making this uh, institute uh, uh, an important um, activity, uh, which is a university-wide activity. And I also want to uh, thank uh, Dean Parenti, whose commitment is to the institute uh, in these financially difficult times has been extraordinary. So what is this institute? What is it all about? Let me just say a couple of words before uh, we turn to the main event. So the mission of the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute uh, is to inform and influence public policy by supporting and uh, developing uh, best available economic research, especially in the area of economic theory. Uh, the Department of Economics has been long acknowledged to be an intellectual leader in the field of economics and has made uh, important contributions to public policy. We haven't been quite as effective in explaining how our research relates to public policy and in, uh, in actually attempting to disseminate that information more broadly. And so the, the, the mission of the Institute is both to support uh, this kind of research and to help disseminate it more broadly. And our basic idea is that by uh, educating an informed citizenry, we will eventually transform public policy, though we do have a number of policymakers in, audience, in, in attendance today. So that's, that's what we're all about. Uh, how do we plan to disseminate this, this, the, the kind of research that, that we and people associated with us do? We plan to have uh, two events like this each year. Uh, so today's event features uh, two distinguished alums of uh, our department, of the economics department of the University of Minnesota, Richard Sandor and, and Bob Litterman. Um, <clears throat> the next event, which will be in April or May, uh, is the exact date hasn't been pinned down. Tentatively, it will feature Aldo Rastichini, who is a, an, uh, uh, one of our senior faculty members, and Nobel laureate James, James Hackman from the University of Chicago talking about the intersection of psychology and economics. Uh, so we have lots of exciting events planned, and in addition to those two events, we will also have uh, an annual policy forum, uh, which will be in October uh, of next year. Uh, please do go, go to the website and sign up. 
uh, to receive information about this. The website also contains lots of information about the kind of research that's being uh, done at the university. I know you're here to me, so I'll, I'll cut the rest of my, my remarks short. Um, uh, we're, in addition to our speakers, we're very pleased to have John Foley, who's director of the Institute for, on the Environment at the University of Minnesota, moderate this session. Uh, and we're deeply grateful to Horizon Milling, a joint venture of Cargill, who's a sponsor of this event, and uh, to our partners in, in organizing and conducting this, this event. These partners include the, the Nature Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund, and the Institute on the Environment. So thank you all for, for coming, and uh, I'm sure it'll be really informative and enjoyable. John, take it away. Thanks, Shari. Uh, well, as Shari mentioned, yeah, my name is John Foley. I'm the director of the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment. And we're kind of a, a sister institute to this new economics institute. Uh, we were formed about two and a half years ago to really collect all of the abilities of the university system writ large from every college and every campus to really focus our research, teaching, and public engagement talents around solving some of the world's biggest environmental problems, including things like climate change, but also things like global food security, fresh water issues, emerging diseases, um, population stabilization, and so on. So we're really thrilled to be here and to be at the inaugural event of the Heller Horwich Economics Institute, which we see as a really strategic partner for the university moving forward. So it's really a thrill to be here. Um, second, I'm thrilled to be here because this is the best of what a public university should be, is to really bring together the talents of the academic community and the real world community that we have here with our, our distinguished panelists, and to do so in a public forum, to make this open, to tear open the walls of the ivory tower and make it accessible and open to people in the state and to our region. And so I'm just really proud to be in an institution that makes that a priority, bringing research and the, the tradition of the public land-grant institution together under one roof. And that's something very special about Minnesota. And third, it's just a, an absolute thrill to be here, to be, to be able to introduce two unbelievable pioneers and thinkers in the worlds of economics and climate and environment. It's just an unbelievable honor to be here with these two individuals and to introduce them to you. And it's really a pleasure because they're both Gopher alumni, okay? That's really good. We love that. It'd be okay if they went to Wisconsin too, but <clears throat> some of you will know that joke. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to be introducing both speakers, uh, first Richard Sandor and then Bob Litterman. And uh, they're going to be speaking one after the other. So rather than introducing them and me standing up and back and forth, I'm just going to introduce them both to you now and get out of the way. And then later we'll have some question and answer time and um, have some interesting discussions, I think. So first I'll introduce Richard Sandor, who'll be speaking first. Uh, Richard is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Environmental Financial Services, LLC, which specializes in investing, designing, and developing new financial markets with a special emphasis on investment advisory services. Uh, Richard is an absolute innovator in finance, and he's known really as the father of financial futures. He's been at the epicenter of environmental financial markets for more than four decades, and he's very well known globally as the founder of the Chicago Climate Exchange, which is the world's first voluntary, legally binding greenhouse gas cap and trade system, as well as the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange and the European Climate Exchange. Sandor has a, just a tremendous list of honors in his work that actually would, I could spend 20 minutes doing that, but I'm just gonna mention a few highlights. Um, his work has been in financial futures and the environment has really garnered an enormous amount of reputation and recognition around the world. Uh, he was honored by the city of Chicago in 1992 as the father of financial futures, which is fantastic. And he was also twice honored by Time Magazine as one of their heroes of the environment for his work on, uh, the, on the father of carbon trading. So again, a real pioneer in, in many, many different respects. Prior to his work in the Chicago Climate Exchange, Sander was a senior financial markets executive with Keter, um, Keter Peabody, uh, Bank Indus Suez, and Drexel Berman Lambert. Um, he's also currently a director of American Electric Power and the Volatility Exchange. And uh, Sandor received his Bachelor of Arts degree from uh, City University of New York and then came here for his PhD in economics. Uh, he's also involved, if this weren't enough, he's also a real uh, civic leader as well, especially in the arts. And I was especially um, glad to see his involvement in a world-leading institution, the Art Institute of Chicago. So first, let's welcome Richard Sandor before I... Um, 
on his tremendous accomplishments. Next, I'd like to introduce Bob Liederman. Uh, Bob has recently retired as a 23-year career at Goldman Sachs Incorporated in research, risk management, investments, and thought leadership roles. Has really done it all at Goldman Sachs. It's incredible. While at Goldman, he oversaw a quantitative investment strategies group, portfolio management business formerly known as the Quantitative Equities and Quantitative Strategy Groups, as well as in Global Investment Strategies, which is an institutional investment research group. Bob is currently the chairman of an advisory board at Kepos Capital, and for the past six years has one of been, a, uh, been one of three external advisors to Singapore's Government Investment Corporation. During, years, during his tenure at Goldman, Bob researched and published a number of groundbreaking papers in asset allocation and risk management, which is cru uh, absolutely crucial to the issue of climate change. He's also the co-developer of the Black Liederman Global Asset Allocation Model, which many of you in the room will know about, which is a key tool in investment management, and has co-authored very, very uh, seminal books, including The Practice of Risk Management and Modern Investment Management, an Equilibrium Approach. Bob earned his PhD in economics also at the University of Minnesota here, and also a BS in human biology from Stanford University. And he currently serves on a number of important boards, most notably Common Fund, the Sloan Foundation, and the World Wildlife Fund. So let's also welcome Bob Liederman here today. So we've arranged for both gentlemen to speak for a little while, and then I'll come up afterwards, and um, we'll do some question and answer and see what discussion we have. Gentlemen. Thank you, John, for that uh, kind invitation. Uh, a, a word of thank you at least to the Heller family because it was your dad and I guess granddad's uh, reputation that brought this kid from Brooklyn uh, out here to the Twin Cities. And graciously, 20 years later, I called him and we had met occasionally. And we had a very important event, uh, and I needed a keynote speaker, and it took Dad about three seconds to say yes, he'd be happy to chair the thing, so thank you. And, and also, if um, the Hurwitz family is here, I did study microeconomics uh, with Professor Hurwitz. I can't call him Leo. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> his image is still daunting. And it's a great pleasure to be here because whatever small successes I've had, I really owe it to the University of Minnesota. It's nurturing, it's thought process, it's discipline and math and theory allowed me to go on and do some practical things. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about value creation, which I think is very, very critical. If we take a look at the period from 45 to 70, value creation in the United States was manufacturing. The expression used to go, how goes General Motors? That's how the US goes. Hard to believe how things have changed. The decade of the 70s, the value creation was in fact inflation. Um, big, big Arab oil embargoes, Russian crops failing, Chinese crops failing, great wealth created and value in the merchandising business and in the grain business. If we go to the 80s, it was financial innovation, I think, that was a big driver. We saw, in fact, the really, the follow through to the birth of mortgage-backed securities with the Ginnie Mays, that spread, the birth of asset liability management, interest rate risks were then managed, financial futures, options, things of that nature. The commoditization, again, a different kind of bank debt called junk bonds. Uh, again, things like uh, Ted Turner couldn't get financed to start. A, he had a crazy idea for an international planetary network. A guy by the name of Terry McGaw came up with something called a cell phone, financed it with junk bonds because the establishment didn't like it and didn't think it was very good. Another gentleman by the name of Bill McGowan thought he'd take on AT&T, and he couldn't get any bank financing. So these financial innovations drove 
the restructuring of the banking industry and the industrial U.S. economy. The 90s were something different. It was another kind of commoditization. This time, the commoditization was of information. The birth of Mosaic and ultimately Netscape, Cisco going public in 1990, the web in 1995, ultimately all followed by secondary actions such as Google and Twitter and social networking, an all different way to reach and commoditize data and information. I want you to please consider the hypothesis that the most important era of commoditization will be taking place now, and that's of air and water. These are our most valuable resources, and we have got to find a way to ration them. This is a public policy question, which I think is very, very important. Uh, you know, most people don't imagine financial innovations as very important. Ken Arrow remarked at a similar conference to where your dad spoke in Chicago that he thought financial innovation was much maligned and misunderstood and underrepresented. And he said at that conference that he thought that the invention of double entry bookkeeping could be ranked with the steam engine or the so semiconductor as important as a financial innovation. The limited liability corporation, the Dutch East India Company, these things are critical, yet most of the public doesn't in your consider much value for economic and financial innovation, but I would like you to consider that as a very important driver, particularly in these times when financial innovation is looked at from askance and recognized it's played a very, very important role. What's that have to do with air and water and sustainability. Uh, in 1960, uh, a man by the name of Ronald Coase wrote a paper on the theory of social costs, and he really suggested that you could commoditize air and you could commoditize other, where if you gave out property rights, the right to emit that bargains or trades could prove to be a better way to deal with tragedies of the commons than command and control. In command and control, you simply mandate a reduction or you basically order a factory or a power generator to make 100 different micro adjustments and that's what they do. No flexibility, it's this way or the highway. Or you could say it's a 10% reduction and not make it plant specific and everybody's got to cut by 10, even though some can do it easily, some can do it more difficultly. Professor Coase's theory was that if you allowed trading a me flexible mechanism, that you could achieve those reductions by a much better path, one that impacted the economy less, gave flexibility. So that is called cap and trade. You take the current level of emissions, you bring them down, for example, by 10%. One particular entity in the economy, if it can, if it can reduce emissions by more than 10%, then it's free to sell those additional reductions to somebody who can't. Perhaps their plant size is too small, they can't switch from high sulfur or low sulfur. They can't switch from natural gas to nuclear. They have to build technologies to comply. So this is the flexible mechanism, and that's what cap and trade is. It is based on that you can deal with and commoditize either air or water by giving out property rights and allow users to exchange them. What's the Chicago Climate Exchange? Chicago Climate Exchange was something that, that was founded in 03, and it was a voluntary association. It, in fact, was inspired also 
by Professor Coase, who wrote an article on the lighthouse and in which he suggested that most economists got it wrong and there were for-profit lighthouses in the 19th century. Even though you had free riding and other things to deal with, commercial entities were set up. In 1999, I was approached by the uh, then president of the Joyce Foundation, who had heard me uh, talk in Rio and, and in the mid-90s in Glen Cove at a UN gathering, and said, you uh, advocated then and you advocated now, basically, to get started with trading, that there was too much talk and nobody was building institutions and you suggested that we get around to, to really try to practically deal with it. I got a grant from Paula DiBerno, who at that point uh, found, was a vice president of the Cousteau Society. She gave us $400,000 to get going. We tested monitoring, verification, all of the things that you hear about naysaying, et cetera. We took a look at the acid rain program, which was a cap and trade program. In the United States, people thought that it would be impossible to reduce acid rain in the United States. Yet in 1990, a law had been passed which mandated that it be cut from 18 million to 9 million tons. Everybody said it couldn't be done. Michael Douglas was making movies like Black Rain. This was going to be the end of the planet, and there was no way it could work. Well, it did work. It went from 18 million to well below 9 million. Electricity prices went down. They didn't go up. Compliance occurred with no problems, and so we said, let's follow that model. We got another $800,000 grant from, and went around to 30 separate entities to see if they would be interested in focusing on and developing a voluntary program, no law, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Ultimately, we got 13 founding members. There were a lot of bumps in the road. We went through two foundation grants, went to friends and family, raised capital. Our first outside investor were the Jesuits, who put in $1.6 million, in it, which was very large. And none of you have ever I think experienced in the investment community quite the kind of dialogue, Bob, that I had with Father Francis. If <laughs> Father Francis would call, my secretary would come in and say, it's Father Francis on the phone, Richard. And I'd pick it up and I'd say, how are you, Father? And he would say, fine, Richard. And then he'd say something that you never want to hear from a man from God. He would say, Richard, how's your burn rate? I would say, Father, it's really high. <laughs> uh, Richard, are you recruiting any no new members? No, Father. Uh, Richard, is there any prospect of legislation to stop climate uh, change? No, Father. Uh, are, do you have enough money to last another year or two? No, Father. Uh, and the end of it, he would end the conversation with something you never hear on Wall Street, guys from investors, I pray for you every night, Richard. <laughs> Not likely heard by investment managers. Uh, anyway, Father Francis came through. We started the exchange. Most importantly, we got the University of Minnesota. We got Cargill uh, as a member locally. We had 18% of the Dow Jones, IBM, DuPont, Intel, United Technology, 11% of the Fortune Top 100 companies, Ford, International Paper, Honeywell, etc. 25% of the power generators, 15 million acres of farms, including the Habertshell farm here in Minnesota, where a dairy farmer took animal waste, covered it with the lagoon cover, took the methane, sucked it into a 
caterpillar generators and produced electricity to run the farm, the dairy, cows, etc., and made $10,000 from the sale of reductions because the methane didn't go into the atmosphere. That kind of microeconomics is what drives a marketplace like this. We went on in the last five minutes, let me just tell you that we went on to ultimately attract 450 members our baseline was 700 million tons. It was 35% of the European Union with no law. Um, it achieved reductions of 400 million tons or bigger than the emissions of France over its time uh, and really sent a model set up and established an exchange in Europe where carbon open interest exceeded Brent crude oil. So it is the largest commodity in Europe in terms of open interest. And then the trails ran off the track here in the United States uh, with the Max Waxman market bill that made it out of the House but didn't go into the Senate. The good side of it is we kept the pilot program going. It worked out well. We sold the exchange about nine months ago, but we left behind a legacy. We like to think of proving it could be done. And in fact, left behind a climate exchange in Beijing, in, in particular the Tianjin Climate Exchange. I want to say something really important, I think, for all of us, and not for me as I don't have a vested interest, we will be third rail and China and India will beat us to the use of market-based solutions. We have passed in the middle of the night, we have gone to command and control, and they're going to capitalism. It is just an absolutely remarkable thing to me. I think I've got Grandkids and kids, desertification, water problems are going to be outstanding. We could have billions of people on the march. And unless we deal with the environment in a serious way that makes business sense and produces financial incentives to achieve social objectives, we will not be in a happy situation in a decade or two. And I would urge you, and as I said to Chari, I'm so pleased and so proud to be among the first speakers with Bob before this institute. It's an important challenge. I'm so happy you've identified the environment as one of the key issues. And to all of you, uh, thank you all very much uh, for listening. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, it's, uh, it's really an honor for me to share this uh, podium with you. I, you know, in my uh, career on Wall Street, I had good times and bad, and uh, during the bad times, I never had a client who uh, called me up and said they were praying for me. <laughs> I, I wish they would have, but uh, usually we had more difficult conversation than that. Um, I guess if we can uh, bring the first slide up. My uh, topic tonight is pricing climate risk. And carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are flowing freely into the atmosphere around the globe these days because emissions created primarily from burning fossil fuels are not currently being priced. The resulting growth in the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is creating an exponentially growing risk of a very significant long-term degradation on the environment. Carbon emissions should be priced because they embed this externality. They increase the risk of a climate disaster. The logic is very simple. Not pricing risk leads to too much risk being taken, and too much risk being taken leads to disasters. The only question really is where should emissions be priced? What's the appropriate level? And that's an interesting story. It's a story of economics. And it turns out the economists who are debating this question are leaving out two key considerations. 
risk aversion, and unknown risk. Let's start with risk aversion. The issue they're trying to address is where to price risk. Risk aversion is central to that question. And yet the models economists have been using to price climate risk have not been calibrated along the risk aversion dimension. Rather, as we shall see, they build in a risk tolerance that is totally inconsistent with what we see in financial markets. And we know why they do this. Incredibly, in the standard economic model that economists use, the utility function is such that when risk aversion goes up, the appropriate price for carbon emissions goes down. This property of the standard utility model makes no sense. Now, in fact, there are more modern, more general utility functions that can capture risk aversion properly. In those models, as risk aversion goes up, the appropriate price for carbon emissions also goes up. And later I'll show you an example. And in those models, we can at least roughly calibrate them to financial market prices. Again, the second big problem with most economic models being used to price climate risk is that they ignore unknown risks. What economists do is they take the risks that they know about, they look at the damages those risks might create, and they, they present value them. When you're running an experiment for the first time, particularly on a very complex system, the Earth's environment, things can go wrong. And there are unknown risks. When the issue is where to price risk, you can't leave out a whole class of risks and just pretend they're not there. At best, such analyses provide a lower bound on the appropriate price. But if we, aren't, if we want to answer the question, what is the appropriate price, we have to include all of these risks. And I'll give you an example of how this can be done. My talk tonight is a challenge to economists, really. There should be a debate among economists about what is the appropriate price for carbon emissions, a serious debate. And in that debate, we should pay attention to two key issues. One is, how do we calibrate risk aversion when we're pricing climate risk? And secondly, how do we model the unknown risks in this experiment with the Earth's environment? And finally, let me share some intuition that I have about how to think about the appropriate price. Because not only is it the case that when risk aversion goes up, the appropriate price for carbon emissions goes up, as we shall see, it's also the case that when risk aversion goes up, the forward curve, the future price of carbon emissions relative to the current price goes down. Higher risk aversion pushes down the forward price, the forward curve. And ask yourself, how high would the price of emissions have to be today for you actually to expect it to decrease in the future as we get more information? It's pretty high. Now let me start out by asking a very simple question. Why should prices in financial markets inform the debate over where to price carbon emissions? Think about what pricing emissions is. It's recognizing the impact of our actions today on the distribution of damages in the distant future. Think of those damages as negative cash flows. Pricing emissions is discounting that set of uncertain future cash flows. It's exactly the same task as pricing inequity discounting a set of uncertain future cash flows. The high observed premium for equity risk is clearly the appropriate metric as we calibrate the level of societal risk aversion in our models for pricing emi emissions. What financial markets tell us is that society in its investment decisions is incredibly risk averse. Clearly, the higher is the level of societal risk aversion, the higher is the appropriate price to pay for reducing climate risk. What makes this story so fascinating to me is that to date, economists have been ignoring this obvious implication. For example, listen to the following recent quote from a leading climate economist. It was taken from an article published just last month. He's talking about the required rates of return on investments in reducing emissions. And he says, quote, my view is that the return on capital is high so that the threshold is pretty high if we're going to compete with other uses of our investment dollars. Now that may sound reasonable, and it is up to a point. This economist 
makes the very good point that capital is a scarce resource. And to determine how much we should invest in climate mitigation, we should evaluate the benefits that we get from that investment. And we should compare them with what we get from comparable investments. So far, so good. The problem here is what comparable investments means. This is an area where the economics profession, and especially the group associated with Minnesota, has made tremendous progress in the last 30 years. As I'm going to show, the tools developed by this group of economists show that an investment in climate change mitigation is not like ordinary capital investments, very risky and demanding a high discount rate. Rather, it's more like an investment in an insurance contract for mankind. Also very risky in a sense, it may or may not pay off, but for which as risk aversion goes up, the payoff should be discounted at a lower rather than a higher rate. The reason higher risk aversion raises the bar for equities is because cash flows created by equity investments are most likely to occur in good times when marginal utility is low. The reason higher risk aversion lowers the bar for climate mitigation is because the benefits of investments in climate mitigation are most likely to occur in bad times when marginal utility is high. I was trained as an economist here at the University of Minnesota over 30 years ago, but for the last 25 years, I've been a financial engineer on Wall Street, working on issues related to pricing risk. On this project, I've had the incredibly good fortune of working with an exceptional economist, Kent Daniel, a former University of Chicago professor who's now teaching at Columbia. Before I start, I want to make two caveats. First, some of the economics is a bit technical, and I've tried to keep this presentation at a very high level, so I think you will be able to understand it. And second, Kent and I are both experts in pricing risk, but we're not experts in climate science. So while we know that the two considerations I've mentioned, risk aversion and unknown risks, will both increase the appropriate price for carbon emissions, we can't tell you what that right price is. And finally, let me be clear, it's not my intention to suggest that there's anything new, any new finance here or economics or climate science. We're simply pointing out what we think are some rather important implications of well-known principles of pricing risk, many of which were developed over the last three decades by folks from the economics department here at Minnesota and at the University of Chicago. So the story starts in Cancun. You may remember the UN climate conference there in November. At the end of it, Mexico President Felipe Calderon suggested that global warming is like a passenger bus careening out of control down a steep mountain road. And he said, we need to brake as hard and as fast as we can. Was President Calderon right? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about pricing risk. First of all, the break that he's referring to is the price of carbon emissions. And if you want to put that in context, I don't know if we can see that uh, very well, but basically the current price of carbon emissions is globally about minus $10 a ton. And that's because there's huge subsidies. The International Energy Agency, it's not particularly an environmental friendly group, they reported recently that in 2009, there were over $300 billion of subsidies of fossil fuel in, uh, in the world. That's $10 a ton. Now in the US, the current price is about zero. The current price in Europe is about $18 a ton. But when you take it all and add it together, it's clearly a negative price. In other words, we're currently not breaking at all. We're accelerating as we go down this road. What's the appropriate price? for carbon emissions? Well, it depends on two things, risk and risk aversion. And we know as risk increases, the appropriate price goes up, and as risk aversion increases, the appropriate price goes up as well. Now, it's a complicated problem, but people actually have a pretty good way of developing an intuition about this. In fact, people are able to solve problems like this very quickly in their head. Think about dynamic optimization in a context where there's uncertainty, tipping points, nonlinear responses. It's like going down a hill 
When you're on a bicycle, I like to bicycle, and I like to bicycle in the mountains. When you're going down a steep hill, you're constantly on the lookout for risks. And when you think you see something new, perhaps there's something in the road, uh, it's wet or it's uh, getting steeper or something, uh, you quickly form in your mind, virtually instantaneously, in the fraction of a second, a plan for how you're gonna respond. Maybe you're gonna brake lightly, maybe you're gonna brake uh, very quickly, maybe you're gonna slam on the brakes. What does it depend on? It depends on your perception of the actual risk that you might go off the road or whatever, and it depends on how risk averse you are. Now, in the debate over where to price climate emissions, some economists tell us, don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll start breaking soon and that, that curve is way down the road. We'll take care of it. Uh, it's, it's not a big problem. Other economists say, no, it's a big problem. We should get started right away. Unfortunately, these economists have not, in their thinking about risk aversion, I, I'm sorry, in thinking about pricing emissions, taken risk aversion into account appropriately. We're going to address four questions here tonight. First of all, what is the appropriate price for emissions? Secondly, what does the forward curve look like? Is it upward sloping? Should we expect emissions prices to go up over time or to come down over time? Thirdly, what's the cost of not pricing emissions appropriately? And finally, how quickly should we move the price to the appropriate level? Now, let's think about the equity risk premium. This was called a puzzle back in 1985 by University of Minnesota professor Ed Prescott and his uh, co-author uh, Raj Mehra. And what the equity risk premium puzzle is, is the fact that investment behavior reflects extreme risk aversion. What I'm showing on this slide are two lines. They're trends fitted to the log of total return of stocks and of government bonds. The lower line, the green line, is fit to government bonds. This is a log scale. So what that line represents is the average annual return, the slope of that line, is the average annual return on a risk-free investment. These are, uh, take, uh, they take the real returns, they take inflation into account. And you get about 2.5% over the last 125 years from investing in risk-free bonds. If you had invested in the stock market, your annualized real return over this period was about 6.5%. That difference, the difference in the slope of those two lines is about 4% per year, which it turns out represents very high levels of risk aversion. I wish I had more time to talk about this. It's a very interesting topic. I brought here a book. This is the handbook of the equity risk premium. 600 pages of heavy-duty math. I highly recommend it if you're interested in the equity risk premium. One of my, actually my advisor, Tom Sargent, is quoted on the back. He says, uh, understanding how to interpret and capitalize on the large observed equity premium is a central task of macroeconomics and finance. Well, we're gonna use this uh, equity risk premium tonight and think about what it implies for pricing carbon. Again, the puzzle is that Investment behavior represents extreme risk aversion. And by the way, the message of this book, it's still a puzzle, okay, after 25 years. Now, why do you think uh, the premium is so high? I think most people would say, well, it, it, it represents the volatility of equities. Obviously, you can see the blue line there. It is much more volatile than government bonds. It turns out that's not the case. If we uh, add another line to this, Here's a return series that's just as volatile. In fact, you may notice there's a pattern. This is the returns you get from being short equities. And if you uh, adjust this uh, portfolio so that it has the same volatility as a portfolio being long equities, you can see you've lost money consistently over time. Now, why is it? Why is it that these equally volatile series, one goes up, one goes down? Well, it's very simple. If you're long equities, they pay off in good states of nature when marginal utility is low. Back during the tech bubble, you can see the blue line is well above the trend. That was a time when times were good. But during the financial crisis, you can kind of see it there toward the end. Bad times, 
your value of your equities went away, and vice versa for a portfolio that's short equity. That's like insurance. It pays off in bad states of nature. By the way, this graph is on a log scale, so maybe it's not so clear the difference in these lines, but if you invested a dollar back in 1885 in portfolio long equities, it's worth about $2,600 today in real terms, adjusted for inflation. Government bonds, it's about $22. And short equities, it's about 15 cents. So it makes a huge difference whether things pay off in good states of nature or bad states of nature. Now this is a very interesting graph. It comes from a paper on, uh, from a, a climate model and uh, it's representative of all of the climate modeling that is currently being done. What it shows on the vertical axis is the appropriate emissions price and on the horizontal axis, it shows what the authors labeled the uh, income elasticity of marginal utility. It's basically the curvature of a utility function. And what they show is, as we increase risk aversion, the appropriate price for emissions goes down. Again, that makes no sense. The economists don't calibrate risk aversion for the obvious reason that if they increased risk aversion to be reflective of what we see in financial markets, it would show the appropriate price goes below zero, that we actually should be subsidizing fossil fuel uh, emissions. Again, this makes no sense. Okay? We'll come back to that slide uh, later. I also want to say uh, this is, what I'm telling you is not new to the profession. Uh, we're building on well-known things that uh, are out there. Larry Summers and uh, Richard Zeckhauser wrote a paper uh, that showed a very simple model for pricing carbon. Uh, we're using that model. What we're doing is we're changing the utility function. Marty Weitzman, a professor at Harvard, has written about the fact that unknown risks haven't been included in these climate models. He points out that the essence of the emissions externality is not the known risks, it's the possibility for catastrophic damages. Frank Ackerman and a number of colleagues uh, have written a paper about the limitation of the standard models used uh, to analyze the appropriate price for carbon. These are called integrated assessment models. They're very complicated. They have many weaknesses, but in their paper, one of the weaknesses they focus on is the fact that the standard power utility function used in those models matches neither the risk-free rate of interest nor the equity risk premium. And finally, uh, a couple of economists back in 1989 in analyzing the equity risk premium puzzle said, you know, you can generalize the standard utility function. And they did, and this Epstein-Zinn utility function is what Kent and I are gonna use. So let me tell you a little bit about utility functions. Utility functions basically are the way that economists model risk aversion. It's the curvature in the utility function. I'm afraid these slides, I don't know if you can see them better than I, but basically the reason that higher curvature reflects higher risk aversion is because the marginal utility goes down as we increase income. What, what these utility functions have on the horizontal axis is either income or wealth. On the vertical axis, the utility associated with that income or wealth. And if you think about, let's say at the endpoints of these curves, uh, maybe it's 100,000 on the right side, and uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, and uh, 300,000 on the right side, and 200,000 in the middle. Think about, would you be better off having a sure 200,000 or 100,000 or 300,000 based on the flip of a coin? Well, you're better off when marginal utility declines having the sure thing. And the more curved it is, the the more you care to have the sure thing, the more you dislike having the uncertainty. Now, it turns out that people react very differently to changes in income at a point in time across different states of nature versus income through time. So when you think about uh, the income that you have today versus income in the future, that's intertemporal substitution. And that's basically a trade-off of a sure thing today versus a sure thing in the future. And the more risk averse you are, the more curved is the utility function, the higher is the interest rate that you require. Basically, you recognize that you're likely to have higher 
consumption in the future because real incomes grow over time. And therefore, to the extent that your marginal utility is much higher today than it would be in the future, you require a higher interest rate to induce you to save. But the real interest rates that we observe in the economy are very low, and therefore, the curvature of a utility function to fit those nominal interest rates is very flat. On the other hand, if you want to fit the equity risk premium, you have to have a very curved utility function across income in different states of nature. And so, for that reason, the standard utility function has a very hard time fitting both low nominal interest rates and high equity risk premiums. This is actually the essence of the equity risk premium puzzle. There is no curvature that will price both of these at the same time. The standard utility function has the property that it uses, this, it's one dimensional, it uses the same curvature across time and across states of nature. And what uh, climate modelers do when they use the standard utility function is they use a very low degree of curvature. And so, for instance, uh, Nicholas Stern, who wrote a report about four years ago, who was basically commissioned by the UK government to come up with a uh, report on what's the appropriate uh, climate policy, used a degree of risk aversion that would price the equity risk premium at about 12 basis points. 12 basis points are hundredths of a percent. So he's 30 times lower than the actual equity risk premium. The risk tolerance that's built into all these models is much, much too, uh, too, high, too, high, too much risk tolerance. It's inconsistent with the degree of risk aversion that we see in the markets. And why is that? Well, it's very simple. When you increase curvature in the standard utility function, it does two things. It increases the risk-free rate, and it also increases the equity risk premium. But it increases the risk-free rate faster than it increases the risk premium. And so if you think about discounting these future damages, you're discounting them at a higher rate. And even though the uh, increase in risk aversion increases the difference between the risk-free rate and a risky rate, they both go up, and therefore the value of that is lower than it was with, with a flatter curve. Now, Epstein's Inn is a way of solving that problem. Epstein's Inn is a generalization of the utility function. It basically says you can have higher curvature across states of nature and lower curvature across time. And so this is just a more modern utility function that allows you to fit both the low real interest rates as well as the high equity risk premium. And all Kent and I have done is we've said, let's apply this Epstein's Inn utility model in the context of price and climate. Following Marty Weitzman's suggestion, we include these unknown risks. We calibrate the emissions cost to uh, uh, a well-known uh, study by McKinsey. We specify the Epstein's Inn utility function, and we set the curvature over time in order to fit nominal interest rates. And we investigate what happens as we increase the curvature over states of nature, the risk aversion in that model. And then we solve for what is the optimal emissions policy. Now, the economic impacts depend very much on the uncertain outcomes of temperature. If you look at this graph, what we're looking at is basically the distribution of potential temperature outcomes in 40 years, that's the blue curve, and in 80 years, that's the red curve, assuming that we don't price emissions. And the horizontal axis, you can see there, it starts at basically zero, and then you get two, two uh, degrees centigrade, four degrees centigrade, six degrees, and so on. As we go out that curve, we're talking about a world very different than the world we know, a world that's very uncertain, and it's very clear that the probability of something bad happening, some uh, positive reinforcement, whether it's uh, methane coming out of the tundra or something else going wrong that creates a tipping point, a positive feedback, uh, something that will make this environment very unfriendly to uh, humans and other species goes up as we go out that curve. You can think of ordering different states of nature. I, I love the fact that economists talk about draws from a random distribution as states of nature. That's very appropriate here. We don't know what the state of nature is, how fragile the Earth's environment is. It may be that it's very robust, that we don't have to worry. 
that nothing would happen. But it's also the case that it may be more fragile and that something very bad will happen. So what Kent and I do is we basically assume that the probability of a climate catastrophe goes up with temperature. And then you make some assumptions about what happens if you get one of these bad draws. If there is a climate catastrophe, how much damage is being done? Now one of the problems with the way economists have been modeling uh, the uh, price of emissions is that they assume that the damages are going to be very small because basically the known damages are very small. If you think about just the impact of bigger hurricanes, rising sea level, these are things that we can adapt to. This, is, uh, this curve I'm showing here comes from a paper from Robert Pindyke called uh, Uncertain Outcomes in Climate Change Policy. And like most economists, he basically in his paper is trying to represent a, a, the economist's view of the world. He says, you know, basically real income is going to grow at 2% a year, uh, as long as we can see, it always has. So 80 years from now, this is uh, what we expect in 2090, uh, people, if there's no climate damages, are going to be about 4.9 times better off in terms of consumption than we are today. Now, there may be some uncertain outcomes. There's uh, a 10% chance that we might only be 4.7% better off. And in fact, one in a thousand times, these economists think we might be only 4.2 times better off than we are today. Let me tell you, if that's the real nature of the risk, we shouldn't worry about it. Some scientists, I quote here Sherwood and Huber, say, perhaps recent estimates of the cost of unmitigated climate change are too low. Indeed, perhaps they're too low. What Kent and I have done is we've done what risk man we added what risk managers call a fat tail. We have these climate catastrophes and we have significant damages associated with them. So we think there's a 10% chance that we might be only four times better off. And in fact, small probabilities that we might be three times or two times better off, or maybe one in a thousand times will only be as well off as we are today. Now maybe we're being too optimistic. Clearly, you never know. But you, you've got to take these potentially unknown risks into account. And what happens? Well, when you build in that Epstein's Inn utility function and say what happens as risk aversion goes up, you get the blue curve. The appropriate price for climate emissions goes up with increasing risk aversion, as indeed it should. Now, Epstein's Inn is a generalization. We can actually force the curvature to be the same across time and states of nature, and then we get the red curve over there on the, on the left-hand side. Now, if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see this, but the uh, horizontal axis on the left-hand graph goes from zero to 60, because it takes about uh, a, a risk aversion parameter of something like 30 or 60, some economists would say 100, to actually fit the extreme risk aversion built into the equity risk premium. So somewhere out there on the left-hand side, uh, is, is what's calibrated to what we see in financial markets. Again, I'm showing the uh, standard model over there on the right-hand side. That scale goes from zero to three. And so the red line on the right-hand side is really uh, duplicating what you see on the left-hand side. It's just an artifact of using the wrong utility function, one that cannot fit risk aversion. Uh, it, it cannot fit the, uh, uh, the financial markets it can't fit the risk-free rate and the equity premium at the same time. Now, oh, I wish these slides had come out better. But anyway, uh, let's answer the four questions. So first of all, what's the appropriate price for emissions? Well, it depends on risk aversion. Uh, if you look at, and I, I don't know if you can see, there's, huh, these lines didn't come out very well. But anyway. Uh, there's a line up there, the, the dark purple line going up. That's an appropriate policy if you have very low risk aversion. It starts at about $15 and then over time increases to about uh, $30 a ton. Now there's another line on there that I don't think is showing up very well. It's what happens if you increase risk aversion. It starts at about $50 and then comes down over time. Increasing risk aversion causes the discount rate to go down 
and it causes the expected future returns on an investment, an insurance type investment, to come down over time. And what happens if we uh, increase the uh, risk aversion is that you price emissions high enough that you actually expect them to come down. The, the, dark, the black line is what happens if we don't price emissions immediately. Well, two things happen. First of all, we continue to freely dispose of our emissions in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is like a reservoir. It has some capacity to absorb emissions safely, but a limited capacity, and in fact, we don't know what that capacity is. It may be that we've already overdone that, we've already used up that capacity, let's hope not. There's hopefully some remaining capacity to safely absorb emissions, but we don't know what it is. The problem with not pricing emissions is that we just wastefully use up that capacity. And you can't put that back in the bottle. That increased risk is a legacy that we will leave for future generations. Plus, if we decide we're going to price emissions a few years down the road, having used up that capacity, the appropriate price at that time will be higher. Think about what the world would be like if we had priced emissions 20 years ago. We'd have a lot more capacity today. We would have a capital stock that would be emitting much less today. And the appropriate price today would be much lower than it is. As we go through time not pricing emissions, the appropriate price goes up exponentially. So finally, well, I, I want to actually, let me go back to that. Uh, the final question that I forgot to ask was, if your current price is zero and the appropriate price is up here, let's say at something like 40 or $50 a ton, what's the appropriate path for emissions prices to go from their current level up to their future level? Well, you know, when you study economics at the University of Minnesota, you learn many uh, good lessons. One of those lessons I, I remember very well because I learned it on uh, one of the problems on my micro prelim. The problem was, it said, defend a policy of government smoothing oil prices. Now this was back in the late 70s, we had just started the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and I said, oh, I know how to solve that problem. I said, you know, I'm a macroeconomist, I know a lot about optimal control theory, I'll write down a stochastic economy, I'll uh, bring in a feedback rule, and smooth prices appropriately. I wrote, it took me about two hours. I was very proud of what I had done. Zero credit. In fact, I flunked that prelim. I don't know if Herb Mowring is here, but he, uh, it was his, pro, it was his uh, prelim and he flunked me. I came in, I, you know, I needed, it was 20 points for that question. I needed five points to pass the test. So I said, what's wrong with my, my answer? He says, well, Bob, the appropriate answer was, there is no legitimate defense of government smoothing oil prices. That's all you had to write. Full credit. <laughs> 20 points. It was the legitimate that I had missed. It was implicit. Uh, what I had done is I had put prices in the utility function. I said, well, people are better off if, you know, prices are smooth or, you know, well, no, that's, what I learned was prices don't belong in the utility function. Allocations of resources belong in the utility function. So if you hear an economist saying, you know, we ought to increase prices smoothly up to the appropriate level, no, that's wrong. Okay, so finally, let's uh, uh, summarize here. This is, this is basically uh, the bottom line on this. It's a cost-benefit analysis of climate policy. I'm looking at three different policies here. In blue is what uh, economists call business as usual, not pricing emissions. The red is what happens if we price at a low value of risk aversion. The green is what happens if we price at a risk aversion consistent with what we see in the equity markets. And basically we look at what happens today, what happens on average in 80 years, and what happens in the worst case. Well, if we don't price emissions, it doesn't cost us anything today. If we price emissions based on a, a less risk averse utility function, we should spend about just a little less, uh, four tenths of a percent of consumption. That's, that's pricing emissions just below, say, $20 a ton. And if we price at a, at a risk aversion consistent with equities, that would be about $60 a ton, and that would be about one and a half percent of uh, current consumption. 
The impact on expected consumption isn't very different. What we have on the bottom is basically a graph showing states of nature across the horizontal axis, and they're ordered from bad to good as we go from left to right. So in our set of assumptions, most of the time, everything is pretty much okay. And so if we do nothing, the average impact on consumption is 4%. If we price emissions, it goes down to 2 and maybe 1.5%. It's really not that different. We're not worried about the expected. What we're worried about is the worst case. What if we get one of these bad draws? The earth is more fragile than we thought. Well, if we do nothing, that's a 50% reduction. By uh, worst case, by the way, this is one in 100, standard risk talk. Uh, it's a 1% it's a worst outcome. 50% decline in consumption uh, in 80 years versus if we do something today, we're basically insuring against that worst case. I think it's about 14.5% impact with the less risk-averse policy, 9.5% impact with the uh, high risk-averse policy. So in summary, what did we do? We added a guess at unknown damages. We used this Epstein's in utility function to calibrate both the real interest rate as well as uh, the equity risk premium. We found that the optimal price for emissions goes up with increased risk, and it goes up with increased risk aversion. We saw that the forward price is also affected, that at high levels of risk aversion, the current price of emissions is high enough that it's expected to come down over time. And we saw that the price should go to the appropriate level immediately so that we don't wastefully use up our capacity to absorb emissions safely. What are the implications? Number one, economists should incorporate the potential damage from unknown risks. Number two, economists should use a utility function which can be calibrated to market prices, both the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium. And number three, economists should be very clear in their advice to the public, to businesses, and the government. Climate risk should be priced appropriately and immediately. So was President Calderon correct? Should we slam on the brakes? Yes, in fact, he was correct. We should. I would put it this way. We should price climate risk immediately at the appropriate level because not pricing risk leads to disasters. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to enter a time in the program where we're going to ask some questions, and I believe there'll be people with microphones roaming around in a few minutes here. So um, while that's getting started, um, I have a really important question to ask first. Um, I was on Google this morning, and I typed in both of your names, along with climate change and cap and trade, just, just for the heck of it. And uh, there are a lot of hits, uh, lots of hits on Google for this. And I was looking for some of the more entertaining ones. And uh, I found a few, actually quite a few. Um, and, and Richard, your name was coming up quite a few times in this, especially. Um, tying you to Al Gore and the, the vast left-wing conspiracy to kind of you know, wreck the economy and to kill jobs and all that. Uh, it's, you know, Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh really love this. So, um, I, so my question, you know, how's the conspiracy going? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think maybe I'll leave that for Goldman Sachs, the nominal co-conspirator, <laughs> the unindicted co-conspirator. Oh, right. <laughs> well, I guess, actually, my serious question for that really is, how did, how did this mythology even begin to happen? I mean, I look at you two guys as, you know, PhD economists from Minnesota, very serious, you know, market-oriented folks who are, you know, using proven market-oriented, you know, solutions. How did this kind of go off the rails in public discourse so badly that this is seen as sort of a radical left-wing agenda? I, I think it's very interesting, and, and um, I will, at the risk of being controversial, um, have to be honest in front of academics. So I didn't quite have a book prepared, and honestly, Bob and I didn't, but I'm guided by this, which is the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. It's not quite as big as the risk premium book, um, but it does have economy of word in it, uh, which is very important. Um, that's by way of saying it started, I think, by economists not being properly represented at the table. The first budget that was set before 
the cap-and-trade debate um, allowed for the government to auction out these rights to emit. In the case of the SO2 program, they were freely distributed. And by the way, the price for the first 10 years was half the marginal cost of abatement. So I would say to my fellow economists, look at some of this, what happened in SO2, what is now happening in Europe, and, and be informed that way. So whoever the economists were in the team put down a $20 price for carbon. Well, you got to look at the numbers. Um, a third of the U.S. emissions are from power generation, a third are from transport, and a third from everything else. If you put $20 a ton on the utility industry, okay, that's your price, it turns out to be 40 to 60 billion a year the entire after-tax profits of the entire power sector in America is $35 billion. So how are you going to get any investment, any technologies? The naivety of that set up a right wing that said, okay, you're going to tax. Now we're going to show you that you're going to bankrupt every utility in the United States. There'll be no CapEx budgets. Nobody can possibly do it. And so all of a sudden you gave, I always liked it. I thought it was good. Uh, I'm a chess player as a kid, and that's what I did. I was taught you're supposed to control the center of the board. So I thought I was in pretty good shape because the right wing hated us because they thought we were environmentalists. And the left wing hated us because they thought we were capitalists. So I thought, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm going to be able to get someplace with this debate. But I see, think the reckless pricing of carbon in a budget and putting a $20 tax set up the right to basically say this was not cap and trade, and they were right. It was tax cap and trade. And so the whole notion of cap and trade got labeled as a tax they were magnificent in their execution of this strategy. You know, I really do think, you know, Glenn Beck, these guys who said it was Al Gore, Goldman, and Richard Sandor that did it, you know. I mean, and actually, people have asked me that question. <laughs> and I said, I never sat in the... I'm not saying I haven't met the appropriate players or sat with the vice president, but I never did sit down with him for the record with Lloyd Blankfein and Al Gore and me never sat in a room together. I just want to swear on my grandchildren that never happened. Um, so I think it ran a wreck by people who on the left lost sight of the fact that the problem was to reduce global warming. It was not to punish the polluter, okay? It's as Napoleon said to his general, if you intend to take Vienna, take Vienna. If you want to punish the polluter, do it on Sundays in your church. Don't do it in legislation. The waxman barkey bill, this is 39 pages. The Waxman-Markey bill was 2,300 pages. The Chicago Climate Exchange, which was 35% of Europe, our rule book initially, the equivalent of the legislation, I told my economists, keep it under the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration. If you make it more than 40 pages, I'll kill you. <laughs> okay, if you can't say it in 40 pages, then it's never going to work. We're never going to be able to convince people. We have to have a governance structure. We've got to have monitoring and verification. We've got to do it cheaply. We have to have price mechanism use costs. That is, the establishment of the bylaws, the establishment and running of an exchange, the choice of electronic things, and then we have to design the financial instruments. And by the way, we did that all 
a million and a half dollars compliance costs to measure a third of Europe, okay? And we hired FINRA because we didn't want people to think it was a black room, Chicago politics type of thing where we were doing it. So we chose to be regulated when we didn't have to be regulated. We outsourced the electronic trading platform. We outsourced the compliance. We have everything and it took us $5 million. And we got a debate where nobody looked at what our exchange in Europe cost to, to run. Nobody looked about setting the deadlines. It became a focus of tax. And neither extreme can walk away with this. And I, I will say one last thing because it, it is a, an important button. I like movies, um, and, and I love, you know, uh, Gone with the Wind, and for a very different reason here, and I want to, for you all to think about a, a, a comment. Scarlett O'Hara was really annoyed uh, at Red Butler, and she came to see him in prison and, and said to him, Red, you know, you deserted the South. You know, why you dealt with and we realized what you do. How could you have done that? I believed in you. And he said to her, Scarlet, there's more money to be made when a society is coming apart than when it's stable. If we don't get control of this climate and we don't get control, you're going to find a lot of people out there that will profit on the demise, and you will have a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will unleash people who will make money from the lack of water, the lack of clean energy, and you will provide perverse incentives that are very dangerous. It's a serious problem. You can build the exchange, it runs every place, around the world, it's going to happen other places. And I do think the economics profession, the work that, that kind of Bob's doing, that hopefully HHEI with, you got to get on it, okay? It is a bad bet, okay, to bet against this. It's like cheap insurance, that's number one. And number two, you don't know what's out there. And what's out there is more inventive activity than you can ever imagine by pricing carbon. We had a price at $2 <coughs> on carbon emissions. I got a call from a professor at MIT. Hey, is that true? Is it $2 if I can cut carbon? I said, yeah. And, and so he sent me a business plan. It wasn't a prospectus. It looked like a term paper, not as... as as elegantly written as a prelim exam, it was this high. He said, okay, I can make, reduce by 50 million tons in year one carbon times $2, that's 100 million. He did it for 10 years and said that's a billion dollars. He didn't even present value the stream. And it was to turn algae into basically biodiesel, and, and he had a way to, to build a pond, you threw the algae on it, 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 it absorbed more in, a, in its weight of carbon than anything like that. To, to cut to the chase, the guy ended up raising $10 million from one of our other members, not because it was a tax, but he saw an opportunity to make $2, okay? And he subsequently, sold it and is working and was cited last year. His name is Isaac Brazine. He's an MIT scientist and just was named as one of the 50 most important scientists in America today. Get any price on carbon. I don't care if it's 50 cents, $2, $5, and let the market work out let the market and, and basically get the inventors. We saw two projects a week. I saw more prospectuses and more business plans saying, hey, I can cut 50 million, I can cut 10 million, and then my clarion cry is to please for the profession to go focus on getting a price on carbon, any price, don't get 
too fancy with it either. Great. Well, um, there are questions in the audience. Perhaps we can start over here. I'm sorry. Or, um, no, no. <laughs> or would you like to? Well, why don't we jump to some audience questions since we um, have some out there. Um, my question is, you know, India and China are constantly arguing that the United States is pontificating the command and control control system, and um, you guys have spent 100 years of emissions, and most of the hole in the ozone layer is as a result of Southern California, and, and here you are telling us what's right and what's wrong. Now, how do we get them to the policy discussion table to the point where they agree to what they're signing up for, and is the, is the market mechanism working globally, or is it just one-way <clears throat> street, at least from the perception of China and India? Great question. I, I think it's working, A. I think, B, we shouldn't be lecturing the Chinese or Indians. Well, we ourselves can't possibly get our own act together. I think it's presumptuous. Um, second of all, they're already on the way. The 11th five-year plan called for a 10 percent reduction in CO2. The 12th is meant to, to decrease energy intensity by 30 percent. It's voluntary. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, when it's voluntary in China, it's not exactly <laughs> like voluntary in America. <laughs> and so the Chinese and Indians will deal with it in their own ways. And it will be market, and then they may be, and rightfully so. 2013, I would, I would bet you'll see trading in China, and 13, maybe 14, and maybe India a year later, and we'll still be debating the issue in the United States. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's very clear. China is going to price carbon long before the U.S., and it's kind of sad. I don't know about India, but. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, and you said it at the beginning, they're more capitalists than we are. They understand that pricing is the way to change things and, and they will make that happen. Reminds me of a comment somebody made to me recently. It was saying, um, if you take all of the OECD countries that signed on the Kyoto Protocols but didn't do very much with it, that if you look at the Fortune 100, there's actually more wealth in that. So if you take the Fortune 100 and China, you're basically done. And uh, that, that's pretty telling because they're all basically top down you know, um, let's get the job done kind of organizations. So that's pretty interesting. Um, let's go over here and see if we have another question. A, a question for Bob. You priced um, emissions based on risk aversion from the e from equity prices. Mm -hmm. Would it not be more appropriate to use the risk aversion based off insurance premiums for, say, cat <coughs> risks? Insurance premiums for what? For cat risk. For, again, you know, uh, insurance premiums for hurricanes, for example, versus the equity risk premium? Well, the equity risk premium is the premium that you're paying for non-diversifiable risk. It, you know, whereas a cat risk is its insurance premiums are actually diversifiable risk. And, and so with an insurance premium, what you're paying for is, let's call it the actuarially, actuarially fair damages. Uh, th there might be a little bit of profit, it depends how you know, efficient the insurance market is, and those do go up and down, but basically it's the expected uh, cost, whereas what we're really talking about here is systematic risk, risk that can't be diversified away, and that's what requires a risk premium in the sense that I'm talking about it. So it's absolutely the equity <coughs> risk premium that tells us what does society charge for non-diversifiable risk. Maybe another question over here? I'm interested in uh, understanding the cost of uh, energy as it stands today. Uh, give you some real prices. In Minnesota, we are seeing around 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, compared to uh, Europe, it's like 25 cents. And compared to China, it's like 30 cents. Uh, one of the reasons why Europe and China see more uh, uh, environmentally friendly energy policies is because the cost of, of the, the capital cost justifies uh, a quicker rate of return uh, because of this high uh, present energy prices. And I did not hear any of those kind of things 
And in, in the US, we are, we are seeing this as a huge problem because cost of energy is very cheap compared to the rest of the world, including Canada, which is right above us. Good point. Uh, Again, I, I think that one has got to be a student of China and, and India uh, to get back to that point. I, I don't think it, it is a cost of power necessarily in the long run. And I do think that China, and let me give you again another example. Um, uh, I'm on the, the board of of American Electric Power. We built a 90-mile transmission line from Virginia to West Virginia. Okay, um, That took 16 years, 15 years of environmental um, and regulatory constraints and 11 months to build it. Uh, we produced power in Arkansas for five cents and we could sell it in Dallas except the Lone Star State of Texas is closed to importing electricity. You can't do it. That's a separate grid. Um, we can't even uh, get to renewable energy that might be as expensive because we don't have a, a national transmission, okay? We don't handle electricity the way we handle gas. It is forbidden to ship it across borders for all intents and purposes. When you could, like that, create 50 or 100 billion of money flowing into the sector and get the transmission from Dakotas down to Chicago or here to Minnesota and lower your electricity costs. But I think that's the, not the right way to look at it because I don't think the Chinese and Indians are looking at it. They want to heat a mass, a standard of living that's here and then they'll take care of the environment. And it won't take them 18 years to build a 90-mile transmission line. OK, why don't we take one more question? We're running a little bit behind our schedule. So uh, maybe one more audience question back there, and then uh, we'll start to wrap it up. Yeah, it seems to me if, if uh, we're going to make some correction to this problem, and let's assume that the climate change problem is, is very serious. First of all, how much emissions reduction is required? I've heard not, uh, amounts like 50 percent, two-thirds, something like that. And if we can take, take carbon taxes to, to 20 or 200 or $2,000 a ton to get those kind of reductions in all of the thousand different areas where you can reduce carbon emissions, which ones will cave first? Uh, which mm. sectors will cave first to what magnitudes? Great question, Tim. It doesn't uh, take uh, very high prices to get very significant uh, reductions in emissions. I'm, I, I totally agree with Richard. You, uh, you look at the free market economy and the way it responds to prices, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Any other comments on that? No, I, I, Bob and I agree. <laughs> Just get any price up there and, and it'll, it'll provoke changes in behavior. Just but, let somebody be able to make money. And, by, by the way, we'll also learn a lot yeah. when we uh, price carbon. We don't, we don't really know. There's tremendous uncertainty what the right price is, how, uh, how much the economy will respond. Uh, I, I think it will respond very quickly to change, you know, to, to a relatively low level of prices. And the challenge is actually a little bit bigger than was uh, suggested, too. If, if you want to stay within two degrees warming, as the only climatologist on the stage, uh, it turns out that you need to reduce emissions by over 80% by 2050 and ultimately to zero by, you know, 2100, 2150. Uh, you can't infinitely emit anything into the atmosphere and expect to do that forever. So that's a, that's a good point, too. So it's actually a pretty big challenge. But with that, why don't we thank our two speakers and very much for a very exciting talks tonight. It was fantastic. <laughs> and Shari will uh, offer some closing thoughts. Uh, actually, I'm not going to offer closing thoughts. I saw a large number of hands that were raised uh, and people wanted to ask questions. Unfortunately, this it's, is kind of brief. Uh, here's, here's my deal. Uh, if you go to, the, to our website, hhei.umn.edu, and send us an email with your question, then one of us in the department, depending on the question, depending on, on Bob and Richard's time, we may even get them to respond, but we'll certainly uh, respond to the best of our ability. Um, so I have very specific instructions. Um, the first, I'm supposed to give thank yous. 
Um, and a second to talk a little bit about HHEI and what, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I suppose I have one other instruction. My um, most trusted advisor suggested I might want to be brief. Um, so I'll try, try and do that. So let me start with thank yous. Um, look, the thing is for successful programs, um, in, in my opinion, there are kind of four things that we need. Um, first, we need a great topic. Um, secondly, we need inspiring speakers. Um, third, we need um, great support. Um, and the final thing we need is an engaged and interested uh, audience. And I think by those standards, this evening's program has really been a smashing success. So starting with thank yous, I, I don't know who I thank for creating um, the topic, um, so we'll just leave that one aside. But I think it's, uh, it's, we really should give a, another round of applause for our great speakers. Um, And um, as a gesture of appreciation, we have a gift. So this is from HHEI to Bob and Richard. Um, second, you know, these things don't kind of happen magically. Um, so I think it's really worth acknowledging the um, extraordinary effort by CLA Communications, university-wide communications, and uh, university relations to put this whole thing together. Um, so let's give a round of applause for them. And the third thing is, um, really, uh, I'd like you all to give a round of applause for yourselves because these things don't happen without an interested and engaged um, audience. Um, and the fact that you all came to, to listen to this and to participate with great questions and kind of more to come, I think is really um, representative of what, uh, of what the university is trying to accomplish um, with Heller Hurwitz, with the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute. And let me just give you a couple of thoughts on, on the Institute. Um, just a little bit about kind of wh why now, why this Institute. You know, clearly in, in a narrow sense, the Institute is meant to um, honor um, and respect the legacy of two of the pioneers of the economics profession and really the, the kind of founders of the modern economics department at the University of Minnesota, um, Walter Heller and Leo Hurwitz. Um, but I think in a broader sense, what the Institute is, is meant to do is really do something that's consistent with, uh, with a public university, uh, which is to educate, um, inform, and by doing so, help influence the direction of, of public policy. Um, so if we think about what the Institute is trying to do, it's really connect the economics profession to some of these broader um, themes confronting society and, um, and do so not just in the economics department itself, but also connect with some of the extraordinary research going on uh, more broadly in the university. And uh, the collaboration with, with John, I think, is a good, kind of a good uh, representation of what the Institute's trying to do. If we think about some other topics that the Institute um, will address in, or is likely to address um, going forward in the, in the roundtables and policy forums, you know, there, there's lots of issues that we can think about. Um, one of the things that's on the agenda is, uh, is early childhood education and how do we think about, um, about the importance of investing in that, in, 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 uh, investing in that particular endeavor. If we think about uh, financial regulation, that's another topic that's, uh, that's on everyone's minds these days. But you know, another one, just to give you one more, is, uh, is pensions, pensions and saving issues. So all of these are the kinds of issues that Heller Hurwitz uh, Institute can, can, can address can address in the context of, uh, of the University of Minnesota, and in, in doing so, be consistent with the mission of public universities to uh, educate, inform, and influence. Um, now, I think I've hit my brevity quotient here, so I want to say thank you again for, for participating, and uh, we all, I think, really hope to, to see you at, the, uh, at subsequent events. Thanks.